Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of 1 Kings. The book of 1 Kings and chapter number 20. The book of 1 Kings and chapter number 20. We're in a series of the life and ministry of Elijah and Elisha. And of course most of the series is going to be centered around them. But today's message is the absence of Elijah and Elisha. But it does require, uh, does have another servant of the Lord. But the thing is, is that it's dealing with wicked King Ahab once again. And in this, we could see in this incident, there's a historical event that is going around. But God sends a servant to do something extraordinary to deliver a message that rings true today. And so if you don't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me, if you don't mind, to the book of 1 Kings chapter 20. The book of 1 Kings chapter 20, and if you don't mind, notice with me in verse number 35. 1 Kings chapter 20 and in verse number 35. The Word of God says this, And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. And he said, And then said he unto him, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. Then he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him, so that in smiting him, he wounded him. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way, and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king and said, Thy servant went out into the midst of a battle, and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me, and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be, thyself hast decided it. And he hasted and took the ashes away from his face. And the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased, and came to Samaria. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the book of 1 Kings chapter 20? The book of 1 Kings chapter 20, and notice with me in verse number 40. 1 Kings chapter 20 and verse 40, notice the phrase where it says, Thy servant was busy. Thy servant was busy. And with the Lord's help, I'd like to preach a message from this. The servant that was too busy. The servant that was too busy busy. And if you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And again, thank you that we could study the history of the Bible and to learn from it. And that we understand that the things written aforetime was written for our learning. And that we could see a principle that we could apply to our lives even today. And Lord, as we go through here, I'm asking that it would be clear just the story, as well as the application and the principle, and that not only would it be clear, but it would be readily to be obeyed, that we can see you work, and that we could watch you bless that obedience as we go out. I'm asking again, because this is a 
spiritual warfare type message. This is a message that definitely Satan does not want us to be obedient. Our flesh does not want to be obedient. That we understand there's a lot of spiritual war coming up to this. I'm asking that you would get the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ by his powerful spirit. So again, fill me with your spirit. Open up your word. Give us understanding beyond measure that your name shall be glorified. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The servant that was too busy. You know, we live in a busy world. There's lots of things to do. And here you have a servant that was way too busy to do what he was asked to do. If you don't mind, perhaps I could catch you up to the story. That Ahab is the king of Israel. And to his northern border is a land called Syria. And once again, the Syrians had came to attack uh, <coughs> Israel. And believe it or not, God helped defend Israel. Even though it was wicked King Ahab, God helped defend him. And in the midst of the battle, they captured the king of Syria. You know what that means? Israel won! But in the midst of this, the king of Syria began to have a negotiation with Ahab, the king of Israel. And for some reason, Ahab let him go. Go home. You're good. In the negotiations, he let the king, the enemy, go home. Just let him go. Well, God was not pleased with this. And so what he did is he sent a servant. He sent a preacher to go ahead and give a message to Ahab to let him know that God was not happy by this. And so we pick up the story that we have a preacher who was sent by God in verse number 35. And he was of the sons of the prophets and he came to his neighbor under the word of the Lord and said, smite me. Now, can you imagine this? Your preacher comes up to you and says, I want you to take your sword and I want you to hit me. Now, normally in most Baptist churches, there'd be a line immediately to form. But here the guy says, no, I'm not going to touch a preacher. But the key word that we see here is that the preacher said this by the word of the Lord. So meaning that it wasn't just the preacher's will here. This was God's will. I need you to smite me. I have a purpose for this. And the guy refused to obey. And so believe it or not, the preacher said, well... Because you refuse to obey. As soon as I leave, a lion's going to come and eat you. And uh, just because you wouldn't smite the preacher. Again, some people will use this as a proof text later on and probably twist it. But that's fine. But <laughs> here, the preacher <laughs> walked away. It was from the word of the Lord. God was trying to get something accomplished. And ask something unusual from a neighbor. And the neighbor refused to do it. So finally, the preacher found someone who was willing to smite him, and he smite him, and he was wounded. And so then the preacher put on a disguise. He made him look like a soldier in Ahab's army. And then he made him look like he was hurt. Of course, he was hurt. He's bleeding. He put ashes in his face. He's making it look like he's battle-worn, and he's laying on his side. And he gets in the way where he knows Ahab is going to come. And so as Ahab comes surveying the battlefield and seeing the things that's going on, the prophet who's disguised as a soldier holding his wound and he goes, King, King. So the king comes over and says, Oh, what happened to you? And so notice what the prophet gives as a story. If you don't mind, it says in verse number, uh, <coughs> excuse me, verse number 39. And as the king passed by, he cried to the king. And he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle. And behold, a man turned aside and brought a man to me. And so here's the story that <coughs> this soldier in the story, the soldiers there and another ranking officer came and brought a prisoner to the soldier and said, your one job is to guard this prisoner. And if the prisoner somehow shows up missing, your life is going to be, this is an important prisoner. This isn't just an average prisoner. This is the important prisoner. And your one job was to uh, guard him. And if he dies or if he shows up missing, your life is going to be in the stead of him. And so when the king heard this, uh, or notice in verse 40 now, and as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. 
So the servant got busy doing this and doing this. And the prisoner just took off. And Ahab hears this story and he gets mad. Of course, the preacher takes off his disguise before Ahab could finish him off. And he said, wait, 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 wait. And Ahab realized, ooh, this is a preacher. He's got a message for me. And the message here was the servant that was too busy. Now, this story kind of reminds me of something we heard from Amy Carmichael. Amy Carmichael was a great single female missionary in India. And she spent all of her life rescuing uh, girls who were capture, or captured or giving their bodies in worship in, in the Hindu temples over there. And she did a lot of rescuing these girls, setting up orphanages, trying to reach each of these girls to show them they can have a different life in serving Jesus Christ. And it was said that as the evil drums of those temples were beating, she fell asleep hearing those evil drums. And one night as she was sleeping, fell asleep to the drums, she began to have a dream. And in this dream, she saw a huge cliff, a deep embankment. And she watched as people were just going one by one in a big mass to the embankment. And one by one, they would be falling off the cliff. And in her dream, as she was watching this, <coughs> she perceived that these people were blind and they did not know that they were going off the cliff. And so here's a big mass of humanity all blind and one by one they would fall off. And she saw that there were some people trying to stand in front of them, trying to plead with them, trying to tell them to go away. But there wasn't enough to stop all the people that were going over. And she was wondering, where are the other people at? How come no one's caring? Why isn't someone stopping? And in her dream, she saw and it went past the embankment to a nearby field where there was a group of people there that were busy. They were busy making daisy chains and putting those daisy chains and busy doing this while just a, just a little ways away, people were falling off the cliff. And as she woke up with the drums still beating, it just sensed inside of her spirit, God speaking to her saying, what? Hast thou done? What hast thou done? And so what we see here is a principle here that there's people that are very busy. And as we come here, I want to show you a couple different things about this servant that was too busy. The first thing I want to show you is that there was a definite mandate. A definite mandate. There was a clear task that was given. What was the task given to this in the story? You guard this man. That's easy to understand. One syllable words, right? Thou guard this man. Easy. And so he had one job to do. It wasn't something that was ambiguous. It wasn't something that was <coughs> not easily understood. It wasn't something that needed to be clarified. It was an easy mandate, a definite mandate, a clear mandate. Guard this man. Do you know that God has given us a clear mandate, a definite mandate? And it is called the Great Commission. The Great Commission is listed in the Bible. It has uh, five parts that make the whole. But if you were to summarize the Great Commission, what is the one thing that God has given us to do? It is to reach people with the gospel and then teach them. Soul winning and discipleship. One thing. One. Only one. Count it. One. One thing that we are given to do. That God gave the church to do. The local church. His people to do. Is to reach people with the gospel. And discipleship. One thing. We have a definite mandate. A very clear order. That we are expected to obey. Not only do we have a definite mandate. But we also have a deluded man. A deluded man. Uh, the idea deluded is that he's fooling himself. He's deceiving himself. A deluded man. Notice this, as you don't mind, in verse number 40. As this uh, prophet is telling this story, notice what he said there. And as thy servant. Now, remember, we've gone over this before. But what is the only job of a servant? It is to 
obey. The job of a servant has one job. And it is to obey. He is to obey what was given to him. Was he given clear orders? Yes. Then what was he supposed to do as a servant? Obey those orders. By the way, we call ourselves servants of the Lord. And so the only job of a servant is to obey. And has God given us clear orders? Yes. To accomplish the great commission. The one thing that we had to do. Now think about this servant. He had the most important job in the entire battle. If you captured the evil king of the empire, what did you, and the most important job is to keep him guarded. Let's go back in time a little bit. And remember when Saddam Hussein was missing? And when the soldiers captured him, what was the most important job they had to do? To guard him. The one job they had to do. And so they weren't supposed to be busy doing anything else. They were supposed to obey the one thing to do. One job to do. And it was the most important job. You know, there's other people that have been given one thing to do, but they failed to do the one thing. Probably one of the most important was Edward J. Smith. You might remember his name as being the captain of the Titanic. His one task was to sail the unsinkable ship from England to North America. One job to do. One task to do. And so it set sail on April 12th, 1912. And it sunk at 2.20 a.m. on April 15th. Three days out. Do you know that Captain Smith had received multiple warnings about the icebergs. Multiple warnings. In fact, the latest warning that the boat had received was the exact location of the iceberg they ran into. They had the location. Not only that, they had the barometer. They had the different warnings. The, even the temperature of the sea. How within a matter of hours, it went from 42 degrees to 32 degrees. They could see that the water was getting colder. They had the location of the icebergs. They knew where it was at. And so the captain should have, with that, with that information, had no problems to do his one job. But you know what he was doing instead? He was playing host. He was making sure that all the rich passengers were catered to. He was taking care of this and he was taking care of that. And he was very busy. He wasn't sleeping on the job. He wasn't resting on the job. He was busy catering to this rich folk and coming over here and seeing how this was doing. And he was playing host instead of doing the one job he was meant to do. He had one job and he failed at that job. And so what you have here is a deluded man. The man said, thy servant. If the servant doesn't obey the master, he's not a good servant. He's fooling himself by saying, I'm a servant when he does not obey. He was given one job to do. Not only do we see a definite mandate that leads to a deluded man, but we see a diluted ministry. The diluted here is the idea that it is watered down. A diluted ministry. Notice what happened in verse 40. And as thy servant was busy here and there. So what happened, the, the, the soldier was given one task to do. You guard this man. And what he was expected to do was to guard this man. But maybe some officer said, hey, you need to go help out with this. Maybe it was that there was another soldier over here that looked like he needed some medical attention. And so he went over to give medical attention. Maybe over here a wagon needed some help unloading or something. And these things are not bad things to do. The problem was is that it wasn't his thing to do. And as he got busy doing this and he got busy doing that and he got busy doing this, he neglected to do the one thing he was meant to do. Because he was doing legitimate things, good things for someone else, he failed to do the one job that was given to him. Oftentimes, 
church ministries have the same thing. They've got lots of activities, lots of things going on, and it dilutes the whole thing. So that way the churches are failing to do the one thing they do. They start coming up with the idea that we're having clowns for Christ, weightlifters for the Lord, jugglers for Jesus. And they have all these other activities. And they're not bad activities. It's not, we're not talking about a fight between the good and the bad. What we're saying is that the good is often the enemy of the best. The best is the never-ending pursuit of the Lord, Jesus Christ. It is to obey the things that God has given us to do. And so what happens is that there's many churches that have soup kitchens. Are soup kitchens evil? They are not. Some people have special um, clothing things, uh, uh, a consignment shop. They have different things where they could clothe the homeless or those that are needy. They have different things of having a, a food pantry. Are those things wrong? They are not. Some people say, well, what we're going to do is that we're going to gain a lot of money. And what we're going to do is that we're going to give out medical supplies. And we're going to give it to those foreign countries that need it. Is that a bad thing to do? Absolutely not. That is a good thing to do. But it wasn't what was given to us to do. Some people will say what we're going to do is that we're going to have special programs. And we're going to work really hard at entertaining the people in the church. And that's not necessarily bad. But it wasn't the thing that God has given us to do. God has given us one thing to do. And so many churches and so many ministries are busy about doing all these other things. But that's not what God had given us to do. And so there is many churches that are busy and they're busy doing this and busy doing this. But they become disobedient because they haven't done the one thing God has given us to do. Now, before I get too much, and by the way, people do criticize. They say, he's just yelling about good things. I understand those are good things. We're not saying they're evil. We're just saying that the good is the enemy of the best. But if you change the motive of it, let's say that we did have a soup kitchen and everyone that came in not only got a hot meal, but we witnessed to them. We're using it as a vehicle to tell people about the Christ. Then it is a good thing. If we have a food pantry and people that are down and out and we could help them with some food with also the opportunity to witness to them about the gospel, then it is not a bad thing we're using as a vehicle to get across the one thing that we're supposed to do. So what we're saying is that everything that a church does needs to be evaluated in the light of the Great Commission. How does it relate to the Great Commission? We have a retirement home. Why do we have a retirement home? Is it just because we want to encourage the old folks? No, it is because we want to lead them to the Lord and encourage them that God still wants to use them. You see, it's lined up according to the light of the Great Commission. Why do we have anything that is going on? And oftentimes we have a diluted ministry. A church that is busy doing so many things that they neglect the one thing that God has given them to do. Which brings us to one last thing here. So we start off with a definite mandate. A very clear order. Then we have a deluded uh, man. A man who says, I'm a servant. But if you don't obey, you're not a good servant. Which brings us to seeing that there's a deluded ministry. That is so busy. And often busy doing good things. But they neglect the one thing they were told to do. Which shows this last thing. A displeased master. A displeased master. So when the king heard the story. Was he happy about this? Not at all. He was upset. In fact he was going to kill the prophet. And the prophet dis uh, took off his disguise. And said whoa, 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 whoa. I was just telling you a story. But why was this whole thing? Why did the servant... Why would the preacher go through all of this anyways? Because he was God's messenger to tell the king that God was not happy. That God was not pleased. One job to do to guard the king of Syria. That God fought for the Israelites to allow the king to be in his hand. And Ahab just let him go. And God said, no. Why would you do that? God was not happy. 
He neglected to do the one thing that he did and it made the whole battle pointless. When you win the battle and you let the bad guy loose, why'd you fight the battle? Just to overturn it like this. It turned everything pointless. And now the fight had to be fought again. Hundreds of thousands of people would perish because the king did not do the one thing that he was supposed to do. And by the way, you can look what happens in the next couple chapters and see once again the king of Syria comes back and haunts the people and he breaks his word to Ahab. And people suffered because Ahab didn't do the one thing he was supposed to do. We take us. Do you understand that God has given us a definite mandate? We are to reach the entire world and preach the gospel to every creature. Someone says, well, that's an impossible job. It is not an impossible job. If you go to the book of Colossians, you'll see that the disciples accomplished the great commission in their day. It doesn't mean they won every one of the Lord, but they gave a clear presentation of the gospel to everyone in the known world. And you know what God expects from us? He expects us to accomplish the great commission within our day. And that's only done if we're obedient. You say accomplish it. You know how many billions of people in the world? Absolutely. You say how can it be done? Can you, have you seen who's all here on this Wednesday night? But let me tell you how God designed it. That if we are witnessing <laughs> to people as we ought. Let's just say that we give a full presentation of the gospel to someone once a week. And at the same time we're discipling. So you take one person and they disciple another person. And both of them are taught to witness to one person a week. The next year, those two people take another two. And they witness to one person a week. The next year, those four people take another four. The next year, those eight take another eight. And the next year, those 16 take another 16. By year five, 32 take another 32. If you had 64 people in discipleship some way, that's a pretty strong church. The next year, 128 takes another 128. And it keeps multiplying. And every week, each of those people are witnessing to one person. Do you know that the entire world statistically can be one in 30 years? It can be done within our lifetime if we're obedient to the one thing that God has given us to do. Why isn't the Great Commission being done? Why isn't it being accomplished? Because God's servants are not obedient. We're busy, but not obedient. God has given us one thing to do. One thing. One day we'll stand before that God. And you know what we're going to be judged by? Did we obey that one thing? Did we do the one thing that God gave us to do? And unfortunately, we are going to have a displeased master because we're not obedient to doing that one thing. Now, we can't do anything about the past. What we can do is start from where we are and move forward. And concentrate on the one thing God has given us to do. It's a definite mandate. We need to be obedient. Otherwise, we'll come up and say, I was too busy. What, why didn't you do what I told you to do? Well, I was busy doing this. Is that what I told you to do? But I was doing this. But is that what I told you to do? But I worked so hard at this. But is that what I told you to do? When it's all said and done, it just made very clear. Did we do what God asked us to do? Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness 
of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you. Thank you.